Thank you very much for the call. You may see. So many, so many things to be said, and I'm getting late, but uh, I'm certainly happy to be here tonight in Chicago, and thank Brother Carlson and Brother Bose for their kindness and all the others for inviting me here tonight to speak at this uh, luncheon or dinner for Brother Bose is going away in the mission fields. I don't know what he goes through with there because I'm missionary also. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here with a brother from South Africa that was in our meetings there and when we was last time in South Africa. And it's a, a precious doctor friend came up here and led that prayer for us. How that we all know what the field of the jungle is when yeah. they get in there and I think it's a worthy thing. You know the we have churches on every corner and hear the gospel any way we want to hear it. Yeah. Those people there have never heard the name of Jesus Amen. many times. Right. So I'm fixing to go back again. I've never been satisfied at home and I don't believe I can ever be satisfied until I get back in the field again over there. Amen. Yes. And so pray for me. And um, that door is closing for me. I expect that. So I just, wow. thank you. If you keep praying for me, just keep praying out. I'll, I'll Stay in the will of God. <laughs> That's the main thing. And uh, and pray for brethren too. That's all right. If they don't see it, well, I better turn on this side over here. It'd be better. If someone can't see those things, well, we can't blame them. But that's all right. If I couldn't see anything, of course, I wouldn't say anything about it. I'd just go ahead. First thing, I'd, I'd sit down and look up the Scripture and see if it was the Bible first because that's where all truth comes from, the Bible. Yeah. Now, Our oncoming services, if there happens to be someone here, we're going to South Carolina, North Carolina from here, and then South Carolina, and to California, Canada, and Alaska, and come back and hope to go overseas from then on for a while. Now, tonight, I had several things here I wanted to speak on, but it's late. I'm not going to speak any longer than 2 o'clock. <laughs> That's a joke. I will read some scripture here on some notes or comments and scriptures I have written down and just pass a few comments and then we will we will turn the service back to the brethren. Now you will be praying for me. I'm I'm sure I depend on that that you have, that you pray for me. Now in the Gospel of Saint John, the first chapter, thirty fifth verse, I want to read down to the forty first verse. And again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looked upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to be interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. And they came and seen where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now, uh, I want to thank you all for this present here that I haven't yet opened. And, and, and then the other night, Brother Carlson just went a little against my thoughts when he took an offering and turned it over to me. And I found a good place tonight for it. So uh, thank you very kindly. I sure appreciate that. And I... Uh, Know that after it's come from yours hands to mine, I had to be the steward of this uh, welfare of God, of this money, and I will place it to the best place that I know where something's being done for the kingdom of God. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Heavenly Father, there's been so many great things said tonight. I wonder if you have another message for the people. Have something that would encourage them or give them faith. 
We've heard from great warriors of the field how I am honored to be in their presence tonight. The men who love you, women, how we thank you for the songs and for the hearts and the attended of the people here at this late hour and still waiting. They're hungering and thirsting, Lord. Here you speak forth in a language that I knew nothing about. You're a gallant soldier standing here and interpret it. It encourages me, Father. I'm so thankful for all these things. Now bless this people, Father, and bless thy word and help thy servant now. If there's a few things that might be said that would help someone, I pray that you will use it now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say that the greatest call there is on earth, in my opinion, is the mission fields. Anyone who is a missionary is an apostle. Or the word apostle means one saint. And the word missionary is one saint. So they're both the same word or used the same. And while they ever preferred to call themselves uh, uh, missionaries, I don't know, but it's a good word, or apostle. Now... I want to take a text tonight from convinced and then concerned. Those two words to just pass a few comments and quote a few scriptures here. On first to be convinced and then to be concerned. Now, from our scripture reading, we have a very great setting. Am I too close to the microphone? Is it banging in your ear? Um, we find today that there is such a falling away. It seems to be that people are not interested like they used to be. They are falling away from the, the fundamental facts of the Bible. They are, seem to be drifting. And I think all ministers who love the Word of God and know that that's the only standard in which we can be assured that we're right is not upon a, some theory, but upon the Word of God. That's the only basis. Right. As I don't want to say this uh, sacrilegious, but in the South it was told that a colored brother once packed the Bible under his arm and could not read. And... Uh, his boss asked him, said, why do you pack it? He said, because I believe it. And he said, I believe it from kibber to kibber and to kibber also. For it's got a holy Bible. And he said, I want to say another thing. I would rather be standing on that Bible than be standing in heaven. And the man said, how would you think that? He said, because heavens and earth will pass away, but my word won't pass away. <laughs> I think he had something there. And if both heavens and earth would pass away. So if you're standing in heaven, it might pass away. In earth, it will pass away. And, but the word will never pass away. So that's a good place to stand. Here in Chicago one night, I heard Brother Tommy Osborne, our gallant brother, say, if it, I believe this word. He said, if it wasn't sacrilegious, I'd put it down and stand on it to show that I was standing there. I thought that was really very cute. Today, we find all that people get away. They get away from the Word, get away from the interest. There seems to be not very much interest in it. We find that and amongst even our own people, the people, uh, full gospel people, that we come to a spot that we are we're overfed. Now, a person gets overfed, gets drowsy, lazy. Our doctor friend there can sure tell you that. If you're overeaten, and I think we Pentecostal people have overeaten. We've seen so many great things to become common to us, you see. And uh, like it was told one time in England, there was a poet who had wrote the poems of the how the beautiful the sea was it's, and the seagulls and how it reflected its beauty of the sky in itself. And, and uh, so he was going to, never seen the sea, but one day he was on his road down to the seashore. And on his road down, he met an old what we would call an old salt, old sailor. And he said, uh, where goest thou, my good man? He said, oh, I am a poet. 
I've wrote of the sea and said I'm, I've never seen it as yet. I've only written on what I've read about and said I'm going down now to have my first experience. I want to smell the briny waters and I, I want to hear the call of the seagull as it, as it circles in the, the, the air and sits frolicking waves as it throws its white caps and the blue skies reflect itself into the water. The old salt stood there and puffed on his pipe a few times and spit. But I don't see nothing so thrilling about it. So I've been on it for 50 years. I was born on it, so I don't see nothing about it. You see, he had saw it so much to have become uh, common to him. Yeah. And I believe that tonight, that that's a whole lot the matter with our churches and our full gospel ranks here in America, that we have seen so much of the goodness of God till it's become common to us. Yeah. We just don't uh, respect it like we should. We think we do, but I, I really believe that we should give more earnest heed to that which we have heard. That's any time we should let it slip. Now, I, I believe that that's true. And when maybe, for instance, one single act of God, uh, here probably you would uh, walk out and say, well, that was all right. But that one act, maybe in some jungle back there in South Africa or Tanzania, wherever it might be, Kenya, would cause maybe thousands to fall on their face and give glory to God. Just that one thing take place. So you can see where the great uh, power of the pulling of the Spirit is the goal where the Word is made manifest. Now, we have sent missionaries into the foreign fields for years. I found the same thing when we come into South Africa where a missionary here with our brother. And... What did we find mostly was reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, I have uh, great respect for, for Africa and for my Africans also, brethren, but what it takes to make a man who don't even know which is right hand and left hand, how you go to tell him anything or lead him to Christ about a tract that you might pass to him that he can't read. See, what he wants, he reads of a God or and he knows about another God and all kinds of gods. But what he wants is something in action, something Amen. he can see. Right. That's the reason the apostles was endued with power, because they were in a day of pagan and different gods as being worshipped, and they wanted to see the manifestation of a true and living God that Amen. could make himself known. Amen. Therefore, I feel that maybe the work is kind of quietening down for me here is, the Lord sending me to the field there because in Durban, South Africa, at one altar call when I seen a boy on the platform was healed and a doctor, a medical doctor, run the platform and said, I want to ask, what did you do to that boy? I said, I never touched him. And he said, I can understand your psychology or telepathy, how I'm reading their minds. I said, doctor, I'm not reading their minds, uh, telling them the things and so forth as you know what takes place. He said... Well, so I put that boy on the stage right there about five minutes ago, and he was hideously cross-eyed. And he come right through here, and I met him, and I said, Now, I, the little fella, anyone can see his cross-eyed. I know nothing uh, how to do it. If I was a doctor and could perform an operation, I'd certainly do it for the little lad. But I said, I'm not a doctor. And I, I said, Now, by, maybe by a divine gift that might cause him to have faith, might causing to have faith enough for his healing. And watching after a few things had taken place and, and uh, that same sort of divine uh, revelation or seeing visions, and no one could condemn that. Our Lord Jesus, his ministry is made up of that. He said, the works that I do shall you also. And uh, the word of God, according to Hebrews 4.12, is a sharper than two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart and and the words made flesh when yeah. we receive it and so forth. So this little lad it said, I see you come from a Christian home in the home where you go into your little what is it called little huts they live in, I forget now. What? Banga. Banga. Said so there was a, there's a picture of Christ hangs at the right hand side of the wall. And the little lad standing there, and he just eating his diet, and his little belly was uh, all dirty, and or he let his food fall down on his little tummy, and, and he's looking around, his little eyes setting together, and I said, the baby, he's a Zula. 
And I said, but his father and mother are small. And uh, the father and mother stood up. And uh, that was correct. I said, now, um, but the thing is that the little baby, when he was born, he was born cross-eyed. And um, the mother and father raised again out there. That was true. I said, the mother, when the baby was born, while well, the father was looking into his eyes and noticed it and took it back to the mother. Correctly, they raised up their hand. I looked back and the little boy was looking at me just as perfect as he could look. I said, well, I won't have to pray for the little boy because he's already healed. You can pass by. And a little British doctor back there, he was certainly curious about that. He ran up there real quick. He said, and Mr. Bosworth said, don't do that. He said, we can't do that now. He said, we don't want any trouble because they're separating the tribes out there now. And many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them were seated around that Durban racetrack and many waiting to be prayed for. And then when he said that, uh, this doctor said, well, here, I want, said, Mr. Branham, what did you do to that boy? I said, nothing. I never touched him. He said, well, he's standing there. He was cross-eyed. Standing here, he isn't cross-eyed. Yeah. <laughs> he said, did you hypnotize that boy? I said, doctor, if hypnotism will straighten cross eyes, don't you think you fellows better practice a little hypnotism? Better? <laughs> I said, you know better than that. And, uh, and he said, well, I, I said, don't you believe there's a God? He said, sure, I believe there's a God. said, the lilies, you know how pretty your big lilies is there in Africa. I said, I believe that if there's uh, gods in that lily or could live, but said tangible enough to make a cross-eyed boy. I said, well, you just have to take my word for it. That's all I can tell you. I said, it's... Uh, there he's standing there and I never touched him and the uh, Lord God which is present now made him to be perfectly whole and there he stands there's nothing to be said about it. I said call the next one just, he said just a moment he said Mr. Branham I'm just a church member if there is a God that's tangible enough to crop, make that boy's eyes come straight on the platform I want him for my Savior and when I was leaving Durban about three weeks later there's thousands out there waving goodbye. He jumped over the fence, ran out there, and put his arms around him and began speaking in an unknown tongue. <laughs> he said, the Lord's called me to the mission field to be a medical missionary. And I said, praise the Lord. See, that's what it takes. That's what we confront today. Reading and writing is all right, but what the people need is the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, we've been a falling away too much in this country is far that from that the church is fell from it now not concerned about it people don't seem to want it they see many bogus things that goes along sure how many ever read the life of Martin Luther well, I was reading in his life and it said it was a strange thing so much that Martin Luther could protest the Catholic Church and get by with it but the strange thing that he could hold his head above all the fanaticism and thought right. of the Bible and right. still stay clean and clear with the Word. Amen. That's right. it. Amen. So you stay with the Word. That's the thing that leads you out. Because God is the Word. Right. And, and we know that Christ is the Word. But today, it's kind of, uh, instead of so much of getting people to the Word and to God and to the Bible, it's come join the church. Support some radio program or or build some great buildings. You know how it is. And um, you know what I believe the reason this is? Is because that uh, they haven't been convinced yet that it's God with us. I believe that. Amen. I believe that people really do that sincerely and think that God is in programs of organizing churches and making big denominations and, and bringing more people in and building finer buildings and so forth like that. That that is God's program. That isn't God's program. It never was. He never did commission us to do that, though as good as they are. He never did say, go into all the world and build schools. Yet we like them. They're all right. They're, never did say, go build hospitals. Yet thank God for every one of them. That's the other people's business. But the ministers is preach the gospel. And the gospel comes back right. word only but through power and manifestation of the Holy Ghost. That's the commission that to a missionary... And always a missionary is right. Yes, all oh, the people believe, of course, that they believe those things. But there, as my old southern mother used to tell me, your action speaks louder than your words. That's right. When we see that people turn down the gospel, how can you say you believe the gospel when you turn down the very thing you say you believe? It just don't work. 
Now, Jesus said, If you love me, feed my sheep. Now, we don't want to feed them educational programs, and we don't want to feed them denominational weeds, but sheep eat sheep food. That's what it takes to make a sheep fat is sheep food. That's the thing. Right, and sheep food is a gospel. Uh, preaching of the power of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bringing him in person to the people. He's not dead, he's alive. Amen. And alive forevermore. He's sure tonight. And that's the gospel. Why was John so certain? Because that he knew that this was the Messiah. Because first, he was convinced that it was the Messiah. You cannot, you can not do very much until you are convinced. And then you become concerned. But until you are convinced, you're not very concerned. I'm sure tonight that people who would criticize divine healing, that would criticize shouting or any other thing that the Bible has or the gifts of the Spirit, the reason that they criticize it is because, or not concerned in it, is because they haven't been convinced yet that it's right. But you let it happen to you once, and then you'll know what's the matter with these people. You'll see then, if it's ever someone said they don't believe in divine healing, you just haven't been sick enough yet. That's all. Uh, you, that's one thing, sure. I'll find a lot of people that says that sickness is a blessing. Ask some doctor if it is. Why is it then you go if you got appendicitis and have the blessing cut out? I'm not sure what you want to do that. That's kind of your own theory. Have the blessing cut out. I wouldn't want to do that. I'd just keep it and die, see. But uh, sickness is no blessing. Sickness is a curse of the devil. Amen. And Jesus said it was. All right. The reason that John was so concerned is because he was convinced that the approaching time of the Messiah was at hand. Because in the wilderness, he had been told that he was to introduce this Messiah. And he was perfectly convinced that he was right and was right on time. I like that. See, if you are, know that you're perfectly convinced, then you're concerned about what you're talking about. How can a man preach the gospel who's not really convinced that he's absolutely got the truth? Amen. How could you do that? But when you are convinced that you know, and how can you be convinced if it's not according to the Scriptures? Amen. You must be convinced, then you're concerned. Amen. That's what makes it you concerned is because you are convinced. Um, he knew his time was at hand and he knew that his message was to preach repentance and so he was convinced and therefore he was concerned of getting out his message before the appearing of the Messiah. Now, he wasn't concerned, John wasn't, in big buildings or educational programs, which is all right they had and they had men who taking care of that. They had the priests and the rabbis and the builders and the intellectuals of that day. They could take care of that. But to John, he was convinced that the Messiah was somewhere then, right there on earth. And he was convinced that they must repent and make straight the way for his coming. So he was concerned of getting out the message. That ought to be the, if we believe uh, the coming Messiah is at hand, I think we ought to lay aside everything else and be concerned of getting this message to the land John is fast as we can do. If we are convinced, but we preach that there's coming a Messiah and want to put a hundred million dollars in a building. And if the Messiah is coming, what good is that going to do? If we believe it, see the very... Uh, our testimony, our action speaks louder than our words does. If I had a hundred million dollars and I believe the Messiah is coming, I would support a missionary program that would sweep around the country right quick and get a church ready for me. I would do it. Therefore, I am convinced that the Messiah is coming soon. And I'm concerned about the gospel getting everywhere that I can know it can be gotten. I'm interested in missionary programs. That's why I'm here tonight. Uh, but my words of the gospel with Brother Joseph and these other missionaries is to see that this word gets out because 
It's got to go to every kindred tribe and nation before he comes. And he's waiting now for that. I don't believe his program's building buildings or educational affairs in the church. I believe it's to get the gospel there for he's waiting for it. It's time past due. I believe this is the time to do it. John knew it's time to be to repent. Uh, ask repentance and to make ready for a Messiah. And if it's time for repentance, then what about now? <laughs> His coming was near. He was with them then. Now look how close. Let's parallel this for just a moment now. John was so sure that the Messiah's appearing was so close, or his coming was so close, that he said, There's one standing among you now. Amen. There's one among you now that you know not. And he's the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, John didn't know him as yet, but he knew his coming was so close that he was already in the midst of the people. Amen. Let me say that, friends. My brother, why do you condemn? When Jesus himself, how many times have I told you, promised as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Did he not promise this very thing that you call me a witch doctor or something about? Did not he promise that would happen? Amen. Then what? We find out at Sodom when three angels went down to preach the message and there was three classes of people always. That's believers, unbelievers, and make-believers. That's, that's always together. And they associate together. Somehow they, they're thrown together. Now there were two of the men that went down and preached to Sodom, to Lot. That was the nominal sleeping virgin, a representation of it, and they preached repentance and never done that much of a miracle. They blinded the people, of course, preaching the gospel blinds the unbeliever. We realize that. And a modern Billy Graham might come into the city here. And God's blessed him and sent him out as a messenger to the denominational world. And he doesn't pull punches. He places it right in there. So he's got a grip on that word of, of repentance. Uh, I know man I know of hardly. Here he preached. Well, why? Wow, that's his ministry. That's what he's supposed to do. But that certainly represented what those men had down there in confirmation of their ministry. But one stayed behind. Now, Abraham represents the church that's not in Sodom, but out of Sodom. Amen. The word church means called out. Amen. And there's a group of people that's been called out of that kind of a life. Amen. Out of those things. Out of those organizations. Here they are, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Catholic, Neobaptist was, and all these things. See, called out, elect, set aside, They're away from the thing. Now, watch what the messenger came to them. He said, Abraham, not Abram. A few days before there, God met him and changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Sarah to Sarah. And he said, Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? And Abraham said, she's in the tent. And the tent was behind him. And he said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. In other words, we're going to have this baby he'd waited on for 25 years. And Sarah in the tent, life within herself. And it said, Me an old woman can have pleasure with my Lord and him old. She is 90 and he was 100. Just ask anybody. That's far beyond any reasons. She is 20 or 30 years past menopause. And his body is good as dead. Yet he staggered out at the promise of God through unbelief. But he believed God's word. Regardless. Now that's supposed to represent the church today. Amen. Through that promised son, he brought a royal seed, which was Christ. And through there, brought in a making a father of nations, which is the Gentile church, the royal seed of Abraham. And we claim to be the royal seed of Abraham and see his word confirmed before us and then refuse to help it or, or to support it or, or even, even deny it. How can we be the royal seed of Abraham and do a trick like that? Amen. Look what happened. And he said, Sarah laughed and said, Me and old woman have pleasure with my Lord again. And the angel with his back turned to her said, Why did Sarah laugh? <laughs> now Jesus said, Now we want first to find out who that man was. You don't give his name. But Abraham who talked with him called him God. 
Amen. The word was used, Elohim. Elohim in the, the Hebrew, I think, is the all-sufficient one, the, uh, the great one, uh, Elohim, the great almighty God. And if Abraham, who met him, called him that, now what did that represent? That the formal world, there would be a Sodom and Gomorrah. Now remember, that was before the fire fell. We were promised fire this time. And before it happened, uh, messengers went down and preached to the church that was still in the formal conditions in Sodom. And the Bible said that the sins of the city even vexed the soul, righteous soul of Lot daily. But the one that came to the elected church performed that kind of a sign. Amen. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son. Amen. And yet they don't see it. I can't understand it. All right. Remember that today, because as you see the church moving up, from one great thing to another great thing, and those people sometimes draw a little fence. If Luther had never drawn a fence, he'd be Pentecostal today. The Pentecostal church today is the advanced Lutheran church. <laughs> it's exactly right. Now, we draw fences if we would make our organizations and end our doctrine with a comma. We believe this plus as much as God will give to us. Amen. That would be fine. But to end it with a period, we believe this and you believe it or you don't come around us. Amen. So therefore, God, you just shut yourself off. Amen. Right. Amen. We must be willing and open to receive God. Amen. And whatever God's got for us with an open heart, Amen. we must receive it. And therefore, when the nations here turn down the word of God, there's heathen genre that's ready to receive it. And the gospel will go from this intellectual nation to the heathen that don't go right hand from them. And that's what's taking place right now. Amen. Exactly. It's Amen. the leaving. Now, John was so sure that he was going to see the Messiah till he said, he's in our midst now. Now watch. Notice there's a great big difference in the sign of Jesus appearing and then Jesus coming. There's two different words. It means two different things. Amen. The appearing of the Lord and the coming of the Lord. Amen. Now the appearing of the Lord is now. When He's appearing in His people... His Spirit working among them, Amen. proving that it's Him with them, getting them ready for the rapture. Amen. For the coming of the Lord to catch away you. Amen. Right. See? Amen. The appearing and the coming. All right. Now, now, the thing we have to do, if we can believe it and be concerned about it, first we've got to be convinced that it is God. Then when we're convinced, then we are concerned. I like that. All right, John knew what he would be. He looked for him because God told him in the wilderness there will be a sign following him. And when John saw that sign, he knew that Messiah was standing there somewhere. Yeah. And he watched it where it went to, and he said, There's the Lamb of God that yeah. takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. For he that told me in the wilderness upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on he is the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost and God. Now, the Bible promises in this last days that these things that you see today would be happening. Amen. Then we see the appearing of the Messiah in the form of the Holy Spirit in the church. Amen. And if the life of a, of a pear tree was in a sycamore tree, it would bring the same, it would bring pears. Because a life in the tree would be. Yeah. Now, be pear tree life. No matter how big, how little, what form it's in, it would be the same because the life in it produces a fruit of it. Yeah. Yeah. And the fruit of the Spirit follows the Spirit, or the Spirit pr produces the fruit yeah. and the signs of the gospel. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Yeah. They would do it. And to how long? To all the world yeah. and to every nation. Andrew as we read of him here a few moments ago, in the coming of the Lord. Andrew, he was just an ordinary Hebrew that went over to see, hear John preach, and he was sure that this prophet knew what he was talking about. 
And then on the scene one day came Jesus and we heard John announce him and saying, There he is. That's the one right there. And Andrew, he said, Now, the thing for me to do is to not criticize John or, or take just that, but I'm going to go with him and find out. I wish every person in Chicago would be that sincere. Amen. Now, Andrew stayed with him all night. Did you notice in the scripture? He abode with him all night. He stayed until he was convinced. And after he was convinced, then he was concerned about somebody else having the same thing he had. But a man's got to be convinced first. And the only convincing thing is the manifestation or the identity of the gospel being identified in you. Amen. When you see that you have passed from death unto life and become a new creature in Christ Jesus, Amen. that's the identity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. How can the Holy Spirit write the Bible and turn around and deny what he wrote? Amen. See, he cannot do it. He's, that's, that's the identity of unbelief. Amen. That's the identity of unbelief. But the identity of belief, Jesus said, these signs shall identify those who believe in me. Now, we know it, that's God's own word. Or Andrew was concerned about his brother after he had stayed with Jesus all night. I'm afraid that, wish we had more time, but I'm afraid that that's what's the matter with our churches today, brother, sister. We just don't stay long enough. Amen. We run in and shake hands with a pastor, put her name on the book, and go home. Amen. Call herself a church member with no burden for the lost at all. Amen. We're not concerned about the missionary overseas. Right. We're not concerned about the starving anywhere else. We got our tummies full and we got a good, warm, nice church and a fine intellectual pastor that would never say anything against the things that we're doing. So we seem to be very well satisfied. Yeah. See? Therefore, we're not concerned. We're not concerned about what goes on. But if you was convinced that Jesus Christ raised from the dead and will judge you for your sin, yes. and that His coming is at hand, and this is the Holy Spirit identifying Himself, yes. then you'd be concerned about other people too. Get me Amen. Amen. Just as, as concerned as Andrew was. It was Jacob. He wasn't very concerned about how he had done his brother. Until one night, he wrestled all night he was a little uh, shyster, as I've often called him. Excuse the expression. But he, he run always around his mammy. And Esau was worked. And then he stole the birthrights from Esau and took off. And after a while, he wasn't concerned. He was prospering, doing all right. But one night, he come in contact with God. Amen. And he didn't let him loose. He didn't say, well, I feel it. Oh, I better get away from here. The difference between Jacob and many of people today... The Holy Ghost will come down upon a sinner and an unbeliever or a critic and try to convince him to be like uh, St. Augustine of Hippo. Instead of going on when he was there at Arenas' church and receiving the Holy Ghost, he took off down to Africa, the Hippo Africa again, and he was the one that made the proclamation it was all right to put Christians to death who didn't believe in the Roman church. And on the martyrology today, 68 million people has been put to death by the church. See why? He had an opportunity to receive the Holy Ghost. He had an opportunity, but he wasn't convinced that it was the Holy Ghost. And you see where his concern went. Amen. Judas had the same opportunity the rest of them did. But he wasn't convinced that that was the Messiah. Amen. So you see what happened. He wasn't concerned about it, about him. Because he wasn't thoroughly convinced whether he was right or not. Now, we must be convinced. After Jacob had wrestled all night, Instead of trying to war away that man, Jacob held on to him. Amen. Oh, I wish we had about a half hour on that. How that wrestling prince, he, he was able to hold on Amen. until he got what he was after. Oh, man, that's right. He held until it took all night, but he stayed there. He wanted to be absolutely convinced. Yeah. And when he stayed until God changed his walking, yeah. he was convinced. Yeah. That's the trouble of us today. We don't stay long enough till we get our walking convinced. 
We don't walk like Christians. If we stay long enough with him, he'll make you walk different, talk different, live different, act different, sleep different, be different. And if we don't stay long enough, we don't hold on. Jacob fell on. He said, let me loose. I've got to go. He said, I'm not going to leave until I'm very convinced. Amen. And when you take a promise of God and hold on to that, um, don't let him lose. Just stay there until you see God come on the scene. Amen. And you're convinced. Amen. And when you're convinced, then you're concerned about others. Amen. There's something about it that makes you concerned. Amen. Yes. Jacob sent forth cattle and everything else to meet his brother. He was concerned about the welfare of his brother after he was convinced that there was a God. After he had had some wrestling with him himself. We need that. Shamgar. Many of you have ever read. It's just about one paragraph in the Bible. Little sentences all wrote about him. I think it's about the 13th judge of Israel. Shamgar. In them days the Philistines would come in when a judge has judged Israel. The Philistines would come in about the time Israel got all their crops grown. Everything put the barn. Everything all right. The Philistines would come right up the road. Take it away from them and their families would go hungry. And take it away. Man said anything to kill him. Go right on in, kill the women, ravish the girls, and so forth. Take their food, go on back over to your own country, and live luxuriously yeah, all the rest of the winter. If you let them live over there, they starve, practically. Well, perhaps year after year, these Philistines that visit. Poor little old Shamgar, he is standing out there one day, and about got his wheel all laid up, all thrashed out, standing in the barn, and he heard something coming up the road. He'd just been looking, probably his wife, for sleeves out. His little girl, thin, peaking face from starvation. He's concerned about him. And now the first thing you know, coming up the road, you hear the stomping. Look down, what was coming to pass? There have come up 600 armored Philistines. Coming up to take his whole summer's store away, take his food for the winter. He knew his wife would be uh, starved out to the winter. His children might die. They would die from malnutrition and he knew there'd be something happened. He was concerned about his family. Now, there's one thing he's got to be done to take care of this situation. He studied a minute. Wait a minute. I am not a soldier. I know nothing how to use a sword or anything. And there's 600 against me. How would I ever do it? I'm standing here with a pair of farmer's clothes on, like overalls or something. And they're all well-trained warriors, great big helmets on and breastplates and things. Trained like one big army. He stood there. He was concerned about his family. But after a while, he become convinced. Amen. Amen. That he had a right. He was a Jew. He was circumcised. He was in the covenant with God through the promise that he gave Abraham. Then he had a right that God would protect him from his enemies. The Spirit come upon him. He grabbed an ox goat. That's a little thing they punched the ox along with. He took that ox goat and jumped out the door and slew 600 Philistines. Yeah. What was it? He was convinced. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Yet this group of people here tonight could get that much convinced that the God that can make a woman here speak in tongues and a man tell something I could foretell or tell forth and the power of God sweeping and take sinners and make Christians out of them, if we could be absolutely convinced that was God, there would be sickness, there would be a revival strike Chicago with this many people that had us all in jail before daylight because it burned this place up with the gospel of testimony of the power of the resurrection. You'd be so concerned. We've got to be convinced that this is God's word. Don't take what some organization said about it. Take what's thus Says the law. Amen. They could be wrong. This can't be wrong. Amen. And if that's contrary to this, then that's wrong and this is right. Amen. This Bible I'm pointing to, that's what's right. God gave the promises. And when God gave the promise to, to Abraham and to, he said he would possess the gate of his enemy. And so Shamgar believed that. And look at the odds against him. God only needs one man. Just let him get one man in his hand. Yeah. The world will think he's crazy, but he'll drive home the gospel. We certainly convinced that Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday and forever. Honor anything else, he'll stand true and go on. Because he's thoroughly convinced that God is God. If he ever was God, he's still God. If he is the God he was, he never was God. That's 
That's right. He's the infinite God. The all-powerful, all-mighty, omnipresent, omniscient, infinite. Oh, my. He's, he's God. Amen. He's the same God that opened the Red Sea. He's the same God that brought Daniel out of the lion's den. The same God that brought the Hebrew children in the fire of the furnace. He's the same God that raised up Jesus Christ on Easter morning. He's the same God that told him the day of Pentecost. He's the same God that raised Lazarus out of the grave. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm convinced that this is the Holy Ghost. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this is that. If this isn't that, I'll just keep this to that comes. Well, I believe this is that. It is the gospel and the power of the demonstration of the resurrection of the appearing of the Lord Jesus in this last day. Making the church ready to be caught away in the bride. Oh, my. What if Shamgar said, now, wait a minute. I've got to wait. Till I see him coming, but I better go away and to school a little while and learn how to make a denominational creed duel. <laughs> duel with him. Now, if he had done that, that's all he would have known about. <laughs> so he had never done the job with his dueling. He just took God at his promise that he would possess the gate of his enemy and he stood there at that ox goat, what was in his hand, and chopped his way through to victory. Amen. Amen. Because he is convinced that if God ever was God, he was still God. Aren't you convinced tonight that the God that was in the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament and the same God today? The Bible said in Hebrews 38, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Therefore he sucketh, forsook a throne, took his choice with the poor, ignorant, illiterate slaves. Why? He esteemed the riches of Christ greater treasures, eternal life, and to have his glory in this world at that time. Have all the glory they want, but what God wants today is men and women who isn't interested in great big fineries and all these other things and building a million more for some organization, but somebody that will take the simple word of God and preach it with all that's in them and wait on God with the power of God manifest himself and show himself the same God that he has. That's right. Amen. Amen. Sam Goddard waited till they learned all the creeds and names. That's all he'd have been able to meet the Philistines with. Amen. But he never waited. No, sir. Oh, we send our missionaries today. Look at the difference in trying to send missionaries, even in our Pentecostal ranks. Or some of our Pentecostal churches, our Pentecostal denominations, has to, our missionaries, before they leave to go overseas, has to stand before a psychiatrist and get a mental examination. That's right. I've been right to school when I was done. Have to stand before a mental test to let a doctor tell you maybe the doctor's an unbeliever. Stand before a, a doctor, a, a psychiatrist to get a mental test. What we need today is not the mental test. The mental test is whether we will believe the Word of God or not. If you don't believe the Word of God, then there's something wrong with you, sure enough. You may have all kinds of degrees, PhD, DDD, and double LD, whatever you might have, but if you don't believe the Word of God, you're an unbeliever. Right. Oh, ten years in school to learn to be a missionary. Ten years have to go to school to learn to be a missionary. Oh, my, that's terrible. <laughs> Ten years to find out whether you can learn the language. What do you do when you try to speak the language? You gum it up like some German been over here six weeks and trying to speak English. You don't know what he's talking about. Same way. Some of them don't even have anything to learn about. How are you going to know the language? What good is it going to do unless you got something to prove to them as you got there? You just become one of them in the same fixed area. <laughs> We don't need to learn a language. We need to learn a heavenly language that's brought down from heaven by the power of the Holy Ghost. Language of the gospel. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. How different these are today than they was on the day of Pentecost. They didn't put them through a psychic test. They didn't put them through a school. There's no sign of them ever being there. But they only didn't have to wait ten years. They waited ten days. <laughs> and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They stayed there until they was convinced that that was the promise. What a 
They've been there for seven days. Andrew might have said to Philip, Say, don't you know what? He told us to come up here and wait. I believe we've already got it. Let's accept it by faith. <laughs> what if Peter would have said to John, You know what? He told us to come up here, so we, I, we've already been here nine days. I, I believe we just ought to accept it. What about a ministry? If they would, they'd have had no ministry. Amen. But he said, I'll send a promise. What is the promise? They could go back over and, and over in Isaiah 28, 19, and said, Precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here and there, a little hold fast, that what's good. For it was stammering lips and with other tongues while I speak to this people, and this is the Sabbath. But I said that they should hear. That's right. Joel said in 2.28, It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Amen. Upon my handsmaids and maids shall I'll pour out of my Spirit. Your old man will dream dreams. Your young man shall see visions. How there be pillars of fire, smoke and vapor. What the things will do to come to pass. So whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They waited until God sent down the convincing power of the evidence that the Holy Ghost was there. A fire set up on each of them like licks of fire, flaming up on them. When they got out into the street, they couldn't even speak their own language and spoke in the language of those people who stand out there listening to them. They was convinced, and that's the reason they burnt the earth up in that day. And the gospel went everywhere because they were fully convinced that it was a resurrected Christ. For they see him performing miracles among them as he promised he would do. They were convinced because the word of God was made manifest in them. How different it is today with the Pentecostal. How different it is. Well, they never talk them before a psychiatrist or something to see if they could really stand the mental test or not. They didn't do it. Here's the mental test. See how far you are along with this. Yes. Yes, some of them people didn't even have enough education to write their name. That's right. They couldn't even write their name. But they were convinced and they were concerned. If they were convinced and had God in their heart, they'd have to be concerned. For Christ was so concerned about the sins of the world that he gave his life for. And if that same Christ was in you, and then you're convinced that it is Christ, you'll be concerned too. Right. We're not concerned about taking the gospel. A minister, maybe the Lord called him into a little place where he can preach or do some work for the Lord. And they don't pay him just well. Somebody offers him a better charge over there. For the money's sake, you'll leave there where God sent him and go over there where there's more money. I'm not convinced that it was God calling there. If you're thoroughly convinced, if you have to eat corn bread and drink branch water, you don't care what the other preacher can have three chicken meals a day and ride in an air-conditioned Cadillac. You don't care. Or if you're convinced that it's the power of God in the South, and you're called to that spirit, raised up Jesus from the dead, and you see him working with you, then you're concerned about your brother's salvation. Not give him a handshake by his name on a book. He's got to be born again by the spirit of God. He's got to have the power of Christ in his life to change him from a dead man to a living creature, lively stone, raised up in joy with Christ in the kingdom. You've got to be convinced first. You never come to a meeting and make fun of a meeting where the Holy Ghost is falling. Uh, you would until you're convinced. And then when you're convinced, then you become concerned. But now wait till you get convinced, and then you will be concerned. Amen. They didn't wait for an education. They didn't wait till they had a great school. They didn't wait till they gave them some papers. They didn't wait for these things. They had Him. Yeah. That's all they needed. And the people they were going to, they were thoroughly convinced that that's all the people needed. Yeah. And I'm still convinced of the same thing. Amen. We don't need all this your stuff that's so-called Christianity today, walking together and trying to unite together like the World Council of Churches. Amen. What in the world when unbelief and unbelievers and everything mixed up together in how we ever go on? Amen. What we need is an old-fashioned, back boot, sky blue, sin-killing religion. Amen. Convincing the man. We need to see Christ come among us and perform and do just exactly where he said, He that believeth in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. More than this shall he do, because I go to my Father. Go oh, is the doctor back here where it was quoted a while ago. I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. 
that I'm convinced he's here. He stay with me here. For two or more was gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. That is the soul, then the rest of it isn't so. It's all right or it's all wrong. I believe it's every word right. I believe he's here now. I believe the same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost is in Chicago tonight. I hold part of it in my heart and I'm convinced that it's the same Holy Ghost. That makes me concerned about getting this message to my brother and sister somewhere. My Baptist brother, my Methodist brother, my Catholic brother, wherever they are, I'm convinced that this is God. And I'm convinced that Jesus is coming. I'm convinced that this is his first appearing in the form of the Holy Ghost in the last days. Because the prophet said, it shall be light in the evening time. I'm convinced that the scripture is fulfilled. I'm convinced, I am convinced that the world's on the threshold of destruction. The world order, cosmos. But I do, I'm convinced that the coming of the Lord is at hand. I'm convinced that what we have is the Holy Ghost. No. I'm convinced that Chicago has been shook. Not the cannon fodder out here. These buildings and up and down the street, these women dressed in more and these men carrying on drunks and carrying on. I'm going to church and taking old light bread, loaf bread, making kosher out of it. I don't believe in that stuff, belching whiskey and stuff on their breath. And go out and take communion or name on some church book and call themselves a Christian. I don't believe that. I believe the church of Jesus Christ is that called out group that's been sanctified by the Lord of Jesus Christ and sanctified for service. And I believe this thing that we see doing is the appearing of the Lord Jesus in our midst. As he said, remember in the days of Sodom, that was a man sitting there that could eat and drink, but it was God in the man showing that God would appear in the last days in the form of human flesh in his church, which is his bride. Amen. And they do the same things he did. Amen. I believe. Someone said, you're crazy, preacher. I said, leave me alone, man. I'm happy this way. All right. They were convinced. They were convinced that all they needed was Jesus. And they were convinced that all the people needed was Jesus. What do we do in Africa? There's such an African man here. We go there and teach them fellows reading, writing, and arithmetic. What do we do? Send them down there, and what do they become? A two child, four more child of hell than it was to start with. They got their own tribal sins, and when they come in, they take the white man's sins. That's right. It makes him worse than he ever was. Out in the compounds and so forth, it's right. Why, he's a murderer. He becomes a raper. He's everything else. He drinks the white man's whiskey. He takes his own sins. When he's out in the tribe, if he done something like that, he'd be put to death for it. Right. Well, he don't need education. He needs salvation. He needs the power of the resurrection. To change that heart. Hey. That's right. Yes, sir. He was convinced that that's all they needed. And they only needed him. And they know that he would meet all their needs. They didn't have to have an identification card. They didn't have to have an organization behind them. They had Jesus, and he met all they had need of. I think that the church would forget a lot of this year's stuff when a revival is coming to town. What credentials? Who can back you up? Christ is our backup. We are his witnesses. That's all Chicago needs. Not a great big cooperation with something. They need the power of Christ, the identification of the Holy Ghost to change man's heart to make a new creature. Vince. Well, there's all they needed was Christ. Amen. That's all they need today. You don't have to wait to go to school and take 35 years before you're ever, you're too old hearted then to get around. What are you going to do? Preach the gospel. Yes, sir. Not education. Don't go out and educate them. Go out and save them, Jesus said. That's right. Like Hudson Taylor, the great missionary, many of you know, to China. This Indian boy, or not a, a Chinese boy one day, got, up, got saved, and the Holy Spirit came up on him. He went to Mr. Taylor, and he said, Mr. Taylor, uh, what shall I do? What school shall I enter? What shall I do? And he said, shall I st- uh, take these years of schooling that the church requires and so forth? Mr. Taylor said, don't take your candle out and burn it halfway down before you find out where it's burning or not. He said, Go when it's first lit. Amen. Oh, I'll say the same thing. Amen. 
You don't need to wait and see it tested and tested and tested and take a lot of trials and tribulations and all this schooling and get your Bachelor of Art, your Ph. and D.D. and everything like that. If you haven't got all that, that's all right. But if you haven't got that, go when, when it's lit. If you can't get a word, tell them it got lit. Tell them how it got lit. That's what they have to do. God you a little candle, go tell them how God lives. <laughs> Amen. Let them alone, just tell them how the candle lives. Let them, then God will take care of the rest of it. The thing of it is, is lighting that candle with the fire of the altar of God, with the power of the Holy Ghost and the resurrection of Christ. Let them alone, don't educate them, don't try to teach all this stuff and do you see what's got us. Bunch of heck, they did but else. That's right. Denying God's word for the form of God is to be better off not to hear about it at all. Amen. Right. What we need is cows lit. What we need is lives lit a flame with the power and the resurrection of Christ shining forth the same kind of light that He gave. I believe it. Don't wait till you're half burnt out trying to learn some language or get favor with some organization when it lights you get going. Amen. Just tell them what kind of experience you had when you got lit. <laughs> then maybe they'll get lit. Light off of your life. <laughs> yes, sir. The blind man that was born blind. He's a good example for us all. Now he was born blind. Jesus come by and made him give him his sight. And here comes uh, all the doctors of philosophy up. And, the, and all the doctors of the priests and uh, the temple come up. The Pharisees, and they were trying to argue theology with him. Now, he, he couldn't argue theology. He didn't know nothing about it. Amen. But, brother, he had one thing. He had an experience. <laughs> Try to argue out of that. Try to tell him he couldn't see. <laughs> he will show you right quick he can see. Right. He might not understand all the, the argument they had to put up, but he sure did cook them. When he said, it's a strange thing that this man can open the eyes of a blind man and yet you claim to be what you are and don't know nothing about him. (laughs) I think he had some good common sense if he didn't have a lot of theology baked into him or something. He sure did. He said, said, well, this man's a sinner. He said, well, he's a sinner or not, I don't know, but this one thing I do know, where I was once blind, I can now see. (laughs) Well, you can say I'm crazy if you want to. You can say I'm... Uh, out of the will of the Lord, if you want to. But this one thing, where I once was a sinner, I've been saved. Yeah. Where I was once gloomy and gone, I'm happy in the Lord Jesus. Amen. I know that something happened to me. Like a colored sister said one time in the meeting. She said, I want you all to know one thing. She said, I'm not what I want to be, and I'm not what I ought to be. But there's one thing, sure, I'm not what I used to be. <laughs> That's a good thing. You know when you pass from death into life, when God takes a hold of you, it's your light. Amen. That's what we need. Some lighted candles. Yes, sir. Yeah, he can see. That's one thing. You could argue out of that. You, you might have told him one thing earlier. He might not have understood all the doctrine of the temple and so forth. But he had a, a good testimony, good experience. More than they could produce with all their theology, yet they could not produce one case at any time a man born blind would ever see. Him. So they couldn't argue that down. So they had to let him once. They just picked him up and threw him out of the building. <laughs> that was their attitude then. It's the same thing today. <laughs> but they're still, I once was blind and now I see. <laughs> Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How happy did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Oh my. Let that be my story. Right here in Chicago, the White Moody, the great evangelist that did have a great revival here one time in Chicago. You know, he was an uneducated man. They didn't hate him too. Well, sure they did. He had no education at all. And he went over to London, England to speak to the copies who, oh my, everything has to be just so and so. And Mr. Moody standing before thousands of them one night, started to read the Bible, and he'd practice on a word to try to pronounce it right, and he mispronounced it. <laughs> he rubbed his head and went again. He tried it again, he mispronounced it again. He looked over there, and all them fellows, you were just about ready to burst out in a big laugh. He tried it again, he missed it again. 
Pulls up the Bible, looked up towards heaven, and said, God, I don't know what it means, but you reveal it to me. Brother, he got something and he shut the whole country. Yes, sir. He might not have been pronounced the word, but God gave him the power that the word meant. I'd rather have that anyhow. Yeah. God gave him something and shook England. That's right. We need some of that tonight. That he had then. He could pronounce his words right, but he, he sure had the, the, the God come on the scene that had said the word, that had wrote the word. Yes, sir. Now, like old Buddy Robinson, and many of you remember him. Why, he was, he was so concerned about the people. Why, he was convinced. I was reading Uncle Buddy. We called him Uncle Buddy. The old pillar of the Nazarene church. I was reading his book here not long ago. He had an old mule. It was called him Eric. And he's practiced, wanted to practice sanctification. And he believed that we should abstain from sin. And said he's plowing his corn and he couldn't make Eric walk the straight line. And he got mad at Eric because she wouldn't walk the straight line. He found out Buddy wasn't walking the straight line either. So then to come to find out, she cranked his corn down and he got so angry with the old mule, he jerked her around and around a few times and his temper got up. He ran out there and bit her on the ears as hard as he could. The old mule ran off a piece and stopped. He went over and sat on a little pile of rocks. He said he got sitting there and I'm like, am I not a saint? Out there preaching sanctification with a mule hair and a teeth. <laughs> the black <of> mule's ears. <laughs> you know, Uncle Buddy had a sense of humor. He said, Eddie, since you're real for big brown eyes around, said, I'm sorry I've done that. Forgive me. The old Eddie looked at me as if to say, no, I won't forgive you because you don't get more religion you got now. You do me that way again. So that's just not the way it is. No need join up with him. You might as well just stay away. He couldn't talk very good. His speech was bad. But brother, he was convinced that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He convinced that he suffered without the gates that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. And he was concerned about the people in his day. Because he was convinced. Yes, sir. First, you have to be convinced before you can be concerned. Don't you believe that? Yes, sir. One time having a revival in the country, there's an old country fellow come in, Pharaoh rolls on, made an altar call one night. And he come up to the altar, he got down. He said, you mean that this Holy Ghost is for me? Yes, sir. He said, how will we get it? I said, just the way the Bible says, get it. And so he said, all right, here I come. He said, I want it. And he got down and prayed a little while, looked up, he said, I ain't getting nowhere. I said, you're the cause of it. Not God's promise. And he got down there and prayed about two o'clock in the morning. Here he come. <laughs> he had it. He changed. Now, he didn't have no education. He didn't have nothing but an old Ford truck and an experience. Yeah. But I'm tell you what he did. He was convinced that it was God. He was concerned about his community. And that old boy with that experience in the Ford truck got 20 other people saved in the revival. All he had was an experience in a Ford truck. And he was convinced that it was right. We got more than that tonight. I wonder if we can be concerned about it. Yeah. It's that farmer was convinced. Samson. Oh, sure. Samson, one day he was convinced. That God was God. He was convinced that God was with him when he could hold his seven locks back there and notice the promise God gave him. He was concerned about his people. He didn't have a thing to fight with but the jawbone of a mule, but he slayed a thousand Philistines. Why? He was convinced, and then he was concerned. David with the slingshot. But uh, what was the matter? He was convinced that God was God. He was concerned about his father's sheep, and he didn't have very much to fight with. But he was convinced and concerned. So he went after his father's sheep and he brought it back. Yes, sir. Now, we could stay here for an hour or more, but we're not going to do it. I want to say one thing. How about Brother Jose here? He's not underwritten. That's right. He isn't underwritten. He isn't sponsored by anybody. But he's convinced Amen. that those people need the gospel. Amen. And he's concerned about it. Therefore, he's trying to take the gospel to him. I think if he's concerned, we ought to be concerned too. Don't you think so? If he's convinced that they need it, and we're all convinced, the brother doctor come up here is convinced, these other missionaries convinced, then if we're convinced, we ought to be concerned. Don't you think so? We ought to be concerned. You say, well, what part's that to me? It reminds me of a little cartoon I see not long ago in a paper. In closing, you might say this. A cartoon inside a newspaper, our home is across the river, a Courier Journal. And there was a, a picture of a father and mother been out drinking all night. 
and on Sunday morning is up about nine o'clock, and they had pictures of Christ all over the house, and Bibles in the drawer, and, and around where they'd been laying there sleeping all night, cigarettes laying on the floor and everything else, and bottles setting up. A little boy got up, washed his face, eat his breakfast, and got ready, knocked at the door and said, which one of y'all go take me to Sunday school? <laughs> That's right. No one concerned. I think we should be concerned. I think we ought to support Brother Bose and any other missionary with all we've got. The first thing we have to do is be convinced that Jesus is coming. This is his program. We ought to be concerned about our brother, whether he's black, yellow, brown, or white. We ought to be concerned about those people over there. And if we cannot go, we ought to dig down and do everything we can to support those that God has called to go. Let us bow our heads. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be, when the voice of God said, Who'll go for us? Then he answered, Master, here send me. Speak, my Lord. Oh, speak, my Lord, speak, and I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord, speak, my Lord, speak, and I will answer thee. Look out over the nations. Millions now in sin and shame are dying. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brother, hasten to their
God, sometimes you have to take the support from others. Let the world turn us down. Sometimes our friends. Yes, yes. Then we get down. Yes. And he seen the cherubims flying through the building. He seen he was living amongst unclean people with unclean lips. He didn't see it till God spoke. Oh, God, speak. My Lord, speak. Speak and I will answer, Lord, send me. Father, we dedicate ourselves to you tonight in the service. We, we sincerely call with all of our hearts for the voice of God to speak to us. Try us now, Lord. Purge us. Let us go through a purgatory right now where we can cleanse our souls from unbelief. Separate ourselves from creeds and fashions of this world. We realize we haven't got much longer to go. It's at the door. We see Israel, a, a nation. We see as it was in the days of Israel, very much parallel to this nation. How did they come in and took the country away from another people and drove the occupants out as we did. We see they had great men at the beginning. They had a Joshua. Then they had a David. Then they had a Solomon. But finally they got an Ahab with a Jezebel to rule. Father, we had a, a Washington and a Lincoln. But I wonder where we're going to. Oh God, we need Elijah today. I pray, Father, that you'll speak to us quickly. Bless our hearts together. Interpret your will to us, Lord, that we might know what to do. Bless these ministers here, Lord. Many of them coming from different walks, different organizations, denominations. God, when they return back there, may they be a, a light that cannot be put out. Neither can it be hid under some creed. But may they shine the light of God that's been lit up in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. Bless every one where it wait upon thee. Bless our precious and lovely little brother. I can think of about three years ago sitting out here on this peninsula his little arms around me crying. And you spoke to us there, Lord. And now, he just can't be satisfied here no more. He's got to go. God be with him. Be with Brother Joseph. Protect him and bless him. Give him souls, Lord. God bless those young men when I see them out on those bicycles. Some of them, Lord, out in there without even shoes on their feet. Then we think we sacrifice. Their hearts are burning for their people because they are convinced and they're concerned. God help us to all be concerned together to see the kingdom of God come. And may we continue to believe what Jesus told us, that he prayed that we might all be one in him. That's our efforts in trying to bring this prayer to pass. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Sorry to help you so long. God bless you. All right, Brother Bozak.